you're on. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, shipmates. My name is Bill Tebow. I'm I was regular Navy in World War II and uh, held the rank of uh, TM SNSS, qualified in American and German submarines. I want to welcome the uh, Groton Base and the Groton Museum, the Nautilus Museum, for this uh, presentation on your 60th anniversary. I also want to uh, mention the Intepid Museum in New York City, who I hope is also on. Uh, they asked me to speak to them too at the same time. I will, okay. I will start uh, explaining about the uh, German U boat production during World War II. The Germans fought the war with six types of U-boats. The Type 7 attack submarine was, uh, they had, uh, they built 709 of them built between 1936 and 1945. The 7 was uh, 252 feet long at 965 tons. Its speed was 18.6 knots on the surface and 7.6 knots submerged. Its range was only 6,500 miles. Fate sunk all causes 607 of the, all the different types were sunk. The boat had a limited range and required refueling at sea. However, this type sank the most ships. The Type 9 attack submarine, they built six subtypes. 200 were built between 1938 and 1945. The size 1,002 tons. The speed was 16.8 knots on the surface, and uh, it had a range of 11,220 miles. Fate, all sunk at by all causes was 170 of the, of the 200. This submarine did a lot of damage to our convoys with a longer range and a much larger torpedo load. The Type 10 <clears throat> was a mine layer. It had vertical mine tubes with two subtypes. Its size was 1,763 tons, and it was 294 feet long. Eight were built, two were type X, uh, 10 A's, and six type 10 B. All were later converted to refueling and supply submarines for the type 7 on this side of the Atlantic. The fate Seven were sunk and one surrendered at Portsmouth, New Hampshire, the U-234 in May 1945. The Type 14 was a refueling submarine, the size 1,088 tons. It had no torpedo tubes, 10 were built 1942 to 1945. They were called Milchu or milk cows by the Germans. Fate, all 10 were sunk. Well into 1945, German U-boats were patrolling off our eastern seaboard in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. In fact, two didn't surrender until long after the war. One in August of 1945 to Canada and the final one in January 1946 in South America. Where they were, where were they hiding? They could not have been at sea that long. Type 21, electro boat, fast attack submarine, length, size 251 feet. 118 were built in 1942 to 1945 but 1,300 were on order. 
The size was 1,621 tons with a 20.6 inch beam, foot beam, excuse me. Fate, 15 were captured, 88 were scuttled in the Baltic, and 17 were sunk in their harbor and the shipyards by bombing. Only two made war patrols, the U-2511, which later went to France, and the U-3008, neither once had a successful patrol. The Type 21 U-boats with their tapered streamlined hull and increased battery capacity were intended to allow longer submersion and a greater underwater speed than conventional submarines. German yards were turning out a boat about every two days, but these were bedeviled by defects, mostly discovered after the submarines were delivered to the Navy. This is a type that I served aboard and qualified in August of 1946 for my German dolphins presented to me 50 years later by the German government with my shipmate, the late Commander Oscar Smith, USN retired. He was a past state commander of submarine veterans World War II and a thresher base member, as was I. <laughs> Type 23 was a coastal submarine. The size was 113 feet with a beam of nine feet, 9.8 feet. And this was so it could be transported on a rail car and go through the tunnels and so forth. 62 were built of which seven sunk in training mishaps or in transit to Norway. Four made war patrols and sank five British ships. Several used hydrogen peroxide fuel. The United States Navy built an experimental hydrogen peroxide powered submarine, the SSX-1. The SSX-1 was built by the Fairchild Engine and Airplane Company on Long Island, New York, with the help of several Portsmouth civilian shipyard workers. The SSX-1 blew up during the refueling at the dock in Portsmouth. The crew and the shipyard workers' topside were blown overboard with no injuries. This ended the experiment deemed not to be safe for use. Comparison of submarine war losses during World War II. Germany, the undersea boot, lost all causes, 784 boats. Yes. I did say 784, which is hard to believe. Officers and men killed in action, 30,436. Officers and men captured, 5,338. Officers and men surrendered, 4,336. Officers and men executed, seven by Germany. Japanese UN, uh, UN Navy, uh, Imperial Navy, I should say, Type R boats and Rs, I boats, lost all causes, 134 boats. Officers and men killed in action, 10,000. Royal British Navy, lost all causes, 74 boats. Officers and men killed in action, 3,144. Officers and men captured 360. The United States Navy lost all causes, 52 boats. Officers and men killed in action, 3,505. Officers and men captured, 16% of the officers and 13% of the enlisted men. Many were executed and all were tortured by the Japanese. The casualty rate of over 23%, the highest service, based on percentage of 16,000 veterans. 
How does the U.S. U-2513 come to the United States and when? The U-2513 and U-308 sailed to New London, Connecticut from Londonderry Island in August of 1945 with a U.S. Navy crew. Each boat was assisted by one German engineering officer and six enlisted men. The U-308 had to be towed partway because of engine problems. Lieutenant Commander Ira Dye, USN, was in overall, com overall command of both boats, and Lieutenant Commander Everett Steinmetz, USN, was in command of the U-308. Both arrived at Portsmouth on or about 7, September 5, 1945, after offloading weapons in New London, Connecticut. Repairs and studies by the ship for repairs and studied by the uh, shipyard engineers. In May of 1945, after Germany's surrender, American U-boat crews were made up of officers and enlisted men which had made war patrols in the Pacific and were home on leave for rest and recreation, also called R&R. But instead, we were ordered to fly to London, England, then on to London, Derry Island to man the U-boats. It was not what R&R &R is supposed to be called. Morale was poor. Most had expected and wanted to return to the boats in the Pacific as the war with Japan was still on. These officers and men formed a new name for themselves in this adventure, FSBI. All had it tattooed on a left aft creek. It stood for forgotten son of bitches of Ireland. They were easy to identify in the shower, and I often think, what did they tell their wives? Comparison of German submarine technology versus USN submarine technology in 1945. German submarine technology advantages a superior torpedo weapons handling and loading system. And the picture on the right was uh, the torpedo, forward torpedo room, the only torpedo room on the boat. It had six tubes. The second system that was uh, operational was the uh, snorkel. Uh, it was used to uh, run the diesel engines and charge batteries and so forth underwater. The third was sonar chin array, transducers in the bow under the torpedo tubes. Very sensitive. Four was the creep motors. Uh, 12 V bolts were driving each propeller shaft for silent running. We could slip away, slip away at three to six knots, and it was very effective. Five was an enlarged battery. We were able to go twice as fast underwater as our fleet boats. Six, hull and fair water streamlining with retractable topside fittings. Seven, shock mounted equipment and light fittings. Eight, rubberized tools for use in the battery wells made them shockproof. Nine, rubberized periscope and snorkel masks with indentations to deflect radar signals and give a wrong, wrong return, false return. <clears throat> German submarine technology disadvantages. <clears throat> One, steel torpedo tubes rather than bronze. They had to be hand scraped and painted. Two, carbon steel seam, seam piping systems in seawater, air, and hydraulic systems which caused rust in pipes, which ruined pumps and compressors. Three, lack of carbon in the hull steel, which made it brittle and cracked at test depths. Four, various defects, which were not corrected before the war ended. A, poor design and construction. B, sabotage. You must keep in mind that most German shipyard workers were slaves who had been captured from other countries. Sabotage was very dangerous for the slaves, and the penalty was death on the spot. We American sailors, while aboard, had that in mind. 
we feared the sabotage, so checked twice <clears throat> to ensure that the equipment was safe to operate. Even one year later, we did find more rags and wood and scrap metal left in the tanks to cause noise so that the, we could pick up the noise caused uh, their problems. <clears throat> and unfinished wells, also loose bolts and nuts on the foundation of the equipment. <clears throat> this fear and checking diminished over time as we corrected the defects in our first overhaul at the Charleston Naval Shipyard in August of 1946. U-2513 was the first submarine it had ever overhauled. Being a German submarine, this was not one of the Navy's best ideas. The pictures that you see on the screen are the U-2513 and their dry dock. They would not sit on our keel blocks properly and you'll see the timbers up to hold it upright so that it wouldn't roll over. See the noise in the sail area. The Germans tried several shapes of sails to attempt to reduce it noise from these sails. This included removal of the two gun turrets and reduce the sail size and the retractable bow planes and retractable topside fittings and masts. This is a picture of the U-25 13 at sea taken for Life magazine. Thank you. Incorporation of German technology into U.S. submarines. The USS Tang SS-563 class was back engineered from the German Type 21 submarine at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, except for the main in diesel engines. Final outcome of the XU-2513. The boat was sunk off of Dry Tortugas west of Key West, Florida, with a missile fired from a Navy destroyer in 1952. Today, it is still used as a recreational dive site located in 82 feet of water. This is an underwater picture that you see of the broken hull from the missile. Personal comment. I am often asked how I managed to become a crew member of a German submarine. And my reply is always luck. Very, very bad luck. <laughs> I couldn't speak, read, or write German. I couldn't even speak French. Heck, I have trouble with English. Once aboard, you could never get off, and believe me, we tried. Some asked to be discharged, staying out for 30 days, re-enlisting and hoping to get a fleet boat. Instead, they demoted one grade, returned to the U-book for much as they had left. <clears throat> the Admiral and the Boat Slot Machine. Fleet Admiral, five star, Chester Nimitz, Chief Naval Operations, came aboard one day in November 1946 for a trial run in a deep dive to 450 feet on the USS UX 2513 off of Key West, Florida. To determine if we were qualified to take the President of the United States for a deep dive and return him safely back to his winter White House on the Naval Base. Admiral Limits, as you might recall, was a former submarine officer. He dropped down the top of the room hatch, scanned the room, and asked, what was the equipment covered with canvas on the alpha bulkhead, and why is it covered? 
The torpedo watch was very embarrassed and replied, the boat slot machine, sir. The Admiral smiled, then ordered, get it off the boat right now. And we did, right then. <laughs> the President in the Fire. President Harry S. Truman, with a large party of VIPs, came aboard about two weeks later. With much fan wave, we got underway, submerged, and started to go deep. 450 feet was our goal. All went smoothly until we reached 440 feet, at which time suddenly all hell broke loose. The fire alarm went off following by the announcement fire in the pump room, which happened to be directly under the president's feet. Rig for fire, screamed my head fight. I had to watch in the top of the room. Babysitting the secret service agents who were scared to start with. I proceeded to rig for fire, close the ventilation vents, and tried to secure the hatch in the forward bat to the forward battery. The captain had secured the control room, ordered the VIPs into the forward battery out of the smoke, including the president. The secret service agents went ape as I closed the hatch, and they cannot be separated from the president's view, and thus would not allow me to close it. About then, my division officer, Lieutenant Gene DiCarlo, thank God, yelled through the hatch, Tebow, why the hell aren't you rigged for fire? My reply was to point at the agents who had their loaded guns pointed at my face. Lieutenant DiCarlo ordered them to stand down. I closed the hatch. We emergency surfaced and started the engines to clear out the smoke. All as the VIPs calmed down, the crew thought it was funny, but our poor officers thought their careers were finished. Two weeks later, the president returned aboard the for inspection. He then made Captain Kassler a permanent lieutenant commander over most, over most senior officers and presented the crew with a letter of commendation. All of the VIPs aboard during the fire, the president was the only one that was cool and calm, and he earned the crew's respect. USS Tang, SS 563 class submarines. <clears throat> I would estimate that the German Navy was about five years ahead of the United States Navy in submarine design in 1945. But because but became 20 years behind the U.S. Navy in 1955 due to nuclear power and a wheel-shaped hull of the Portsmouth-built USS Albacore, AGSS-569. The Nautilus, the SSN-571, was a 10-class hull, lengthened to add a reactor compartment. Nautilus was the last boat of the class. A former engineering officer aboard the U-2513, Lieutenant Robert the Rock Armour, who had qualified me in 1946, was assigned in 1950 to Portsmouth as a ship superintendent for the tank class construction. He had always wanted me to work for him in the engineering rate on U-2513, but I wanted to retain my right arm rating so I didn't transfer, which was a big mistake by me for it cost me a couple of stripes or two. When the Rock heard that I was an electrician in Shop 51 at Portsmouth, he requested that the shop assign me to the Tang onboard launching crew, the sea trial crew for all future boats, which advanced my career. He was a real shipmate and officer. He was a Mustang and a gentleman. In 2004, I was interviewed by the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard Training Division about my service on a German boat, the U-2513. Previously, I had done other interviews for them about the Thresher, Thresher disaster 
and subsequent level one and subsidized quality control programs. Bill, can you go yep. back to underneath your lobster? Your lobster. It's underneath the table. One added a attraction to for us crew members <clears throat> uh, was the fact that uh, while we were in uh, overhaul in Portsmouth in 1948 after a main engine failure during snorkeling, we had to go to Portsmouth for a replacement because that was the only place that had a German engine. Local shipyard workers and their part were part-time late lobstermen realized that I had been a shipyard worker myself in shop 51 when I was 16. Asked if I'd like to lobster. I of course said, oh yes. So the next day, a uh, paper bag full of cooked lobsters was dropped down the hatch. And uh, I started to break them open. Captain Castle happened to go through the far drop the room on entering the boat and he smelled lobster and he asked me where I'd got them and could we have could he have one he ate two or three then wanted to know how we could keep alive lobsters on our return trip to Key West I replied put alive in an empty torpedo tube flood it partially with uh, seawater add a little air and uh, we ate uh, lobster for several days on the return to our home port at Key West. <clears throat> Most crewmen didn't like lobster, but a few did, and they joined us in the, for our noontime meal uh, in the torpedo room. The captain wanted butter added and asked the steward's mates to melt butter. So this is pretty good service for the enlisted men uh, to be eaten was the captain in the torpedo room. Thank you very much. One more here. So Bill, I'd like you to, uh, to, to describe what people are seeing in this video. Okay. Okay. You're looking at the uh, only Type 21 submarine, which has been modified quite a bit. The bow has been redesigned and so forth, but that is a Type 21, and uh, it's on just public display sure. in Germany. Let's go down on the bow here. That's the conning tower of the uh, Type 21, and you'll see the gun mounted up on the top. The two twin 20 millimeters. Uh, the class wanted 30 millimeters up there, but they ran out of them, and they had to use the uh, 20s on the ones I was on. Uh, this is the torpedo room, uh, the torpedo tube number four, and. Uh, as you can see, they're steel and they do rust. And it was a terrible job to crawl on those tubes and try to clean and paint them, paint them. Their loading system loaded the torpedoes in there much faster than we could with chain falls. This was all done electrically. The racks were lined up and were movable. And uh, almost all submarines follow the, that technology even to today. Maybe not the same configuration, but the same principle. Uh, it looks like, well, it's still in the top of the room. We're looking forward into the tubes. Is that a cutaway of a torpedo? Yeah. Looks like an officer's stateroom. That probably is. Uh, 
We didn't have staterooms for us. We didn't even have bunks when I first went aboard. We had to sling a hammock anywhere we could find room. In the Charleston overhaul, they did put bunks in the top of the room so that we could uh, be more comfortable, which we were. Radio room? Yeah, that looks like the radio room, yeah. Batteries? Yeah, uh, yeah, but this was the top off. Huh. It's always been, yeah. Okay, they've exposed the element. Uh, uh, oh, that's one of the heads. We had three heads on there, as I remember, two for the crew and one for the officers. Uh, the control manifolds. The, uh, in the this is the control room. What was that access hatch for, uh, Bill? I'm, I'm really not sure what that is. That throws me. It's just a different uh, view of this. The after room didn't have any torpedo tubes, and it was just a uh, stern room for the uh, uh, rudder and the uh, stern planes. Very tight. Only one or two guys could get in it. It was so small. We got our galley. Streamlined. This is a galley. Uh, where they did all the cooking and poor sailors had to wash all the dishes. I lasted one day in there. <laughs> I get sent back to the top of the room. <laughs> Apparently I didn't do a good job. Bunk room? Yeah. The after battery, they put uh, some bunks in there too. So enlisted, similar to others. This must be back by the engineering spaces. Yes, it is, but I'm not sure where. Well, it's like depth gauge is probably in the control room. I think that's back after the oh, engine maybe. spaces, yeah. That could be. See the engines? Are those the motors? What are those? That was the shaft. Yeah, was yeah, shaft. yeah, a power shaft. <clears throat> You'll notice that the the hatches between compartments are on the German boat they're round, whereas on an American boat they're oval. Uh, it's much easier to get through a round one with your shoulders in a hurry. Yeah. And they always had a uh, a bar welded above it so that you could grab it and swing your feet through. Duck your head though. <laughs> it hurts when you hit that steel bulkhead. Tell me about the um, uh, the engines on board the boat. The what? The, the engine? engines. Uh, they were a man engine, and uh, they uh, were pretty good. Uh, the only trouble we ever had with them mainly was when we ducked a snorkel in 1948 and ruined the engine. The salt water doesn't compress and it blew the engine up. And that's why we had to go to Portsmouth. The tan class of submarines, they didn't put horizontal diesels, they used uh, round pancake type engines. And they, well, the idea seemed very good, but the engine was on top and the generator was down below and it all the oil leaked down into the generators and motors and, 
and that was made of them impractical, and a lot of them had to be towed back. And eventually, the boats was lengthened just a little bit, and they took the pancake engines off for that class. I think uh, EB built four, including the uh, Nautilus, and we built three of them. Talk to me about the, the Type 21. What if this had been available to the Germans earlier in the war? Uh, they had real old World War I type submarines. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> I'm not sure what the what they class was, but there was something similar to our S boats. Mm -hmm. uh, our S class was the same way. It had uh, uh, riveted hulls and so forth. No heat, no uh, air conditioning. What about problem. this boat now, the 2513? If this had been available to the Germans earlier in the war, would it have affected the outcome? It certainly would have. The Battle of the Atlantic, it certainly would, because they could go faster underwater than our surface ships could go on the top, the merchant ships and so forth. Uh, it, it would have been deadly, and we would have had an awful time to find them with that creep motor, because uh, they, what we operation we were doing was the naval air station at Key West and the sound school, and we would go out and they'd try to find us, and very often at noon time the captain said time to go back, and we'd head back in, and we'd be at Key West sitting down on the South Beach drinking beer. <laughs> and that poor airmen are out there and the blimps, they had blimps, they had destroyers, they had aircraft carriers, everything chasing us. So the admirals made a recommendation that we tow a boy. And this was like a 55 gallon drum on a, on a steel cable. And it went through a shear valve. So the first time out, the captain at noontime says, let's head for the band boys. And we closed the shear valve, which cut the cable <laughs> and left the thing floating up there. The Admiral was not pleased. <laughs> they did have an awful time trying to find us. And their sonar system was, uh, uh, if I remember right, we, we could pick up a ship 100 miles away. An American sub sonar at that time could pick it up about 10 miles. Wow. So it was a big and that chin array put it right in front of the boat deliberately so it, the engine noises and from aft would, and cavitation from the propellers would not bother it. And uh, I'm afraid they would have sunk a lot of our ships. Do you have anything else, Bill? No. Okay, let's open it up to questions. Are there any questions? George, you got any on your end? Do we have any questions? No, nothing on our end, Kevin. Okay. Anybody on anybody that's currently on? Do you have any questions for Bill? <laughs> I'll just chime in, Kevin, and say that this has been a fascinating presentation. Uh, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, John Miner said it's been a fascinating presentation. Thank you. Thank you. You got any questions? We really appreciate it. <laughs> Jason, well, Jason's here, and so that's what we were trying to think of a question for you. It's okay. pretty scary to think that how the war could have changed if those U boats had gotten done faster. So we're thankful that they weren't out there. She said, she said your comments on how these boats could have changed the war. She's glad that uh, um, you weren't out there and the boats went, took longer than they expected. <laughs> right. right. They talked about that. I watched that. Yeah. They, they had more time. The technology they had was so much greater than we had. Yeah, that's scary. Very scary. Bill, you've talked about the funding for the German Germans as well, right? Uh, Donitz, he kept trying to get money for the programs, and Hitler kept shutting him down, right? Yes. Yeah, the pro while well, the program was delayed, the to to manufacture thirteen hundred submarines was 
tremendous amount of money, and he, he expected the war to last at least 10 years. And of course, mm -hmm. it did not. Um, and it, we're just lucky that they got only two out to see. Bruce, any questions? Uh, no, I don't have any questions, but I, I do. I, it, I relate to this a lot, and I, I'm really, <laughs> I'm really thrilled that three of my boats that I was on for a long period of time were in this uh, video. The Tang, uh, which was when I was on it, was on their third re re-engineering and. <laughs> And uh, uh, the uh, Nautilus, of course, and and of course to hear the mention of uh, how much damage the uh, sabotage did to the uh, German building of the of their fleet uh, resonated a little bit because I went through a very bad um, period of. Did you? Uh... Serve on the, did you commission a tang? No, I did not commission a tang. Oh, okay. I, I went on in there after I was, um, I was, uh, I had been engineer of the uh, Sterlet before I went to the tang. He was but, engineer of the Sterlet, then he went to the tang. Okay, I had a shipmate <laughs> that uh, commissioned a tang, uh, Harry Vols. He became a lieutenant later on, he stayed in the Navy. Yeah, he was on the Tang, and I worked on it uh, as a civilian after I got out of the Navy, and I never saw him at Portsmouth while it was being built. But I ran into him years later through my daughter out in Arizona, and uh, we chummed around a lot together, climbing yes. mountains and stuff. <laughs> tell, tell me, t tell us about uh, the time you uh, passed out in the torpedo tube. Oh. Uh, I don't know if Brenda knows this story. There were only two of us small enough to go into the torpedo tubes. They're 21 inch diameter, and most torpedo men are pretty rugged for a reason because a, a torpedo weighs over a thousand pounds, and and uh, so they're big and big shoulders and so forth, and they couldn't get in. But one fellow who was nicknamed was uh, Russian because he was Russian. His name is Igor. Santa Costa. Oh. And he and I were both small enough to go in the tube. So we'd start at the top, go in the tube, and it was always, uh, we'd have to crawl all the length of the tube, about 20 odd feet, and scrape and paint it and uh, wire brush it, clean it out, and then uh, paint it. Between the paint smell and the uh, dust from the uh, rust, we passed out, both of us. And the fellow that was supposed to be tending us, making sure we didn't pass out, he'd gone back after to get a cup of coffee. <laughs> he didn't fail, uh, do very well because he was demoted for it. Oh. <laughs> uh, we were both uh, only unconscious for a few minutes. The minute they dragged us out, we, we came to it. But if we'd been in there longer, it, could have been a pretty tragic. We wouldn't be doing this presentation. No, we wouldn't. <laughs> and I wouldn't be here. <laughs> Brenda said she yeah, would. Yeah, I heard it. I can hear my daughter. <laughs> this, is, this is Bruce. I, I can relate to torpedo diving. I never had to maintain torpedoes, but I was an auxiliary man. And Bruce once in a while, our, our GDU would, our garbage disposal unit GDU. would be out of commission, GDU. and we would load our garbage into the torpedo tubes. And every time, <laughs> most of the times when we did that, it left remnants in there, which made them unserviceable, unusable. So somebody had to go dive them. And uh, experiment did worse things than that. <laughs> That's great. Oh my goodness. George, do you have anything else on your end? Do you have any questions for Bill? I think we lost George. All right. <laughs> Are there any more questions from anybody? Thank everybody for attending.
Yep. Thank you, everybody. And, uh, thank you. Bill, thank Bill you I want to say thank you so much nice for doing this you, for us. Uh, I got Tony and Betty here, so we're going to go ahead and switch on to our second presentation. Excellent, Bill. Yeah. Okay. No, you you wanted to pull your vest back. Oh. Yeah, Bill. Bill wanted to pull his vest back. You see? Oh. This? Yeah. <laughs> He's got Portsmouth Naval Shipyard on there. He wanted everybody to see that. And in addition, does everybody see the two dolphins on his shirt? He's got the U.S. dolphins on top, and he's got the German dolphins underneath it. Okay, he's one of the few people I know. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Bye bye now. Thank you. Bye. 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 Good seeing you bye, all. Bye, Hi, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> That's my other daughter. <laughs> Jason, come over here. I've got one more out there. Is she on? <laughs> no, I don't think she made it. She oh, was okay. trying. She didn't have Zoom on her new computer, so it was going to take her too long to load it up. Yeah, okay. But Jason, Jason made it to most of it. Yeah, I see you. Hi, Jason. My hey. grandson. <laughs> Great grandson. <laughs> Great grandson. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Thank, thanks, everybody. Everybody take care. Thanks, Kevin. You too. Thanks, Kevin. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye. Let's go in here. Okay. <laughs> Thank you.